JM on Cars is kindly sponsored by Car Vertical, the only car history checking service you'll need, which references more than 20 databases globally to make sure you don't buy a car with a hidden past. For a special discount on the service, please use the link in the description down below. And now, today's feature presentation. Hello everybody and welcome to another entry in my summer playlist of Porsche Boxster Alternatives. It's that time of year, the sun has started coming out on a regular basis and you might be thinking that you'd fancy yourself a nice little sporty convertible to see you through the next few months. Now there are many reasons why you would want a Porsche Boxster, they are after all brilliant cars, but there are also a few reasons why you wouldn't. Perhaps it's a little bit too obvious, a little bit too common. Maybe your Porsche dealers left a bit of a sour taste in your mouth. Or perhaps you're just the kind of person like me who wants to do things a little bit differently. Well, today's car is certainly that. Now, the last two videos in this series were fairly conservative alternatives if you're thinking of something a bit different to a Boxster. The Mercedes SLK 55 and the Mazda MX-5. Nothing really especially stand out about about those. But today is where the playlist goes off the rails just a little bit because I am behind the wheel of a Maserati Gran Cabrio. And I can honestly say there really isn't anything out there quite like the Gran Cab. You see, this is based on the Maserati Gran Turismo, which is in turn based almost entirely on the fifth generation Quattroporte, of which I now own an example. And that means that it's a rather unique proposition. Because this car underneath is more or less exactly a Quattroporte, that means it's absolutely enormous, but that means that it is a genuine four-seater convertible. Now I know those things do exist, you can get a four-series convertible, you can get Merc convertibles, all sorts of stuff, but I don't think there is a car out there with this level of badge that also offers this amount of space with a roof that comes down. It, Jaguar XK, not in production anymore, but neither is this, and, and that has token rear seats of no use to pretty much anyone. Same thing for the Aston Martin DB9, Mercedes SL of course is even even worse, having no back seats at all. Ferrari California, same thing again, seats only useful to the tiniest of human beings. But this, you really can take four adults out in. And it's a pretty good looking car too, isn't it? The Gran Turismo, I think, is one of the sexiest four-seaters ever made. It's just a stunning piece of design, and I do look at them occasionally with lustful eyes and think, oh, did I make a mistake getting the Quattroporte? And they go, no, 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 I, I do need the four doors and the, the added practicality that comes with it. However, if you don't, there are a lot of reasons why you might want to pick one of these up. Now, your price of entry is realistically from about £35,000 onwards. And if you have been looking at Gran Turismos, there are a few things you need to know about the Gran Cabrio. First off, all of them come with the automatic gearbox. I don't believe the Gran Cabrio ever got the F1 style gearbox, the MC shift that Maserati offered in their other cars. This is a good thing because the ZF Auto is a great gearbox. It shifts quickly enough. No, it's not gonna set the world on fire if you're used to modern PDKs or the ZF8 speed. It's a little bit lethargic, but it definitely gets the job done. You also only got these with the 4.7 litre version of this fabulous Ferrari built engine. It's in the same trim here as in my Quattroporte Sport GTS, meaning it makes 440 horsepower, which sounds like a lot until you realise quite how heavy this car is. It is in the real world nudging 2.1 tonnes, and that's before you sit in it. Now you may reasonably think because a convertible is that heavy, that's because it's got lots of strengthening in it, so it must be nice and rigid. No, not really. This isn't the worst convertible I've ever driven for scuttle shake, but it's not brilliant. However, unlike some others, SLK for example, in its normal mode, the suspension in this car is actually reasonably soft. Softer than in my Quattroporte, which has fixed rate dampers. And that gives the chassis half a chance. However, every single pothole or speed bump you go over will result in the windows clattering about quite a bit.
The interior does also feel a little bit out of date, although very high quality. In 2010, this is already starting to feel a little bit past its prime because you have to remember the Quattro Porte on which this is based came out in 2003. So it was really a seven year old design when it came out. However, this car does have in the eyes of many one trump card. Allow me to play it to you now. without a doubt one of the greatest soundtracks ever. Now this car's very kind owner Luke, who's actually lent it to me for a couple of days, assures me this is a standard exhaust and I've got to say I'm surprised at that because this sounds pretty much like the system in my Quattro Porte and that has a special exhaust system just for the GTS. This one though isn't switchable and it sounds like my system with the valves open all of the time. Now when you're in the mood for it, that's a great thing. However, there are a lot of times where I wish I could actually make it go away a little bit because it can be a little bit intrusive, especially when you're on the motorway. So th th that's a shame. The auto gearbox too, when you do leave it in automatic, does a, a, a good enough job. It's still smooth and everything, but it's not very responsive. You have to put your foot down a lot further than you think in normal mode to get it to shift. And if you put it in sport mode, it will do the job, but it then seems a little bit too keen to change down and you often find yourself making a lot more racket than you really wanted to. If you are trying to take your grandmother out to lunch in it, could wind up being a little bit embarrassing as you turn up sounding like Michael Schumacher's just arrived. Today is actually a very unusual day because it's much nicer than it looks. Usually the opposite is true and in fact for the last six months here in Britain that has definitely been the case. We've had some gloriously sunny days that have still been bitterly cold. Today it's actually 20 degrees, 21 according to the car, and yet I'm pretty convinced it's going to rain at any moment. You can actually deploy the roof with the car in motion. That surprised me, however, it's not a quick process at all, nor is it very elegant. However, when the roof is up, it's actually a very nice place to be, very refined. It's a lovely Alcantara-lined affair too, and it's, I'm very glad that Luke held out for a car with a, a lighter coloured interior. Many of them are either black or red, and he didn't want either of those, so he held out for this, and it's absolutely gorgeous. There are some changes, of course, versus the Quattro Porte, but this is more or less a Gran Turismo inside. The engine does respond nicely, as you might expect, but it just doesn't have that much pull low down. From about 3,000 RPM, it, it seems to get a rig along and it's not a slow car, of course it's not, but that massive curb weight really does blunt the engine. You have to remember too, this is a naturally aspirated lump, so unlike the Mercs, which have been turbocharged or supercharged or anything like that, it just doesn't have that torque to, to really get it moving. Hopefully, very soon, I'll be able to drive the Ferrari California, which was allegedly a Maserati design from the beginning, and I'm going to be very curious to see just how that car fares, because it's actually got a very close relative to this engine, a 4.3-litre version, but with a Ferrari flat-plane crank, so I expect it's going to have a very different character. The view out of this car is pretty good. You can see a little bit of the bonnet, and although it is absolutely massive, I mean, this, this car is huge. It's about five metres long. It's not that difficult to place and you can really enjoy it. So now we're in town, let's talk about some of the boring things and we may as well begin with reliability because let's be honest here, that's probably the main thing putting you off buying a Maserati or indeed any other Italian car. In truth, it's a mixed bag. 
these cars will be expensive to maintain. I would not be doing my job if I told you you'd be able to run one of these on the same budget as a Boxster, because that simply isn't true. They have a vicious appetite for various components, suspension bushings, aircon compressors, they will leak from various places and they're often places that are quite inaccessible, so your labour rates may be very high. You do need a trusted independent and if you are buying one of these you want to see a service history from a company that knows what they're doing because the last thing you ever want with a Maserati is somebody fiddling about with it who doesn't really know what they're doing. That's where the really big problems can begin. The one issue that is genuinely killing these things is rust. You see it's mostly steel underneath here and the front subframe is one very large piece of steel that didn't really get much in the way of corrosion protection out of the factory gates. And that means a good few British winters, plenty of salt on the road later, and often you'll find yourself looking straight through your subframe. That's not good. The problem is so bad that the Maserati factory has now actually run out of spare subframes. So if you are thinking of buying one of these, please do get it professionally inspected beforehand. I recommend an inspection for a lot of cars, but with these, I'd say it's an absolute necessity. Please just get it done. And even if your subframe is fine, I'd then recommend taking it to Sport Italia, which is where I'll be going with the Quattroporte soon. And they have a service, which is not very expensive, where they can completely rust-proof your whole subframe, meaning you'll never have to worry about it ever again. They are also very, very thirsty things these, I'm going to make an educated guess, this being the same engine in a car with the same gearbox and roughly the same weight as my Coach Porte, that it's going to drink the same. Luckily these have a fairly large fuel tank and that's just as well because if they didn't you wouldn't be going very far between visits to your shell station. On a run you can achieve reasonable economy, over 25 to the gallon is possible but this is a Ferrari V8 and because you're going to be playing it like a musical instrument yeah, probably not going to be driving it in the most economical of fashion. So expect as a running average, high teens. That means you're probably going to be getting about 300 miles to a 100 to 120 pound tank of fuel. Yes, that's expensive. A lot more than a box that I will concede. But if you buy one of these sensibly, you may find it experiencing not much in the way of depreciation. So there's that to counter it. So let's set all of that aside for a moment. What is this car like when you get it on a beautiful slice of British B Road? unsurprisingly, much like the Quattroporte, so long as you've got this car within its window of ability, it's a very, very pleasant thing indeed. The best way to experience this car is driving it around at about six or seven tenths, not using all of the rev range, using the gearbox more than you need to, making that sweet, sweet music, and enjoying what's actually a, a very nice ride quality. I never liked the Skyhook dampers in Maseratis because they didn't really tend to get it right, but by the time this car came out, they more or less got it there. So in normal mode, it's actually very comfortable, and honestly, even in sport, it's not that bad either. It gives you a little bit of extra body control for what seems to be like only a very mild penalty. It can get a fair wriggle on, but you do need to be very careful because Maserati set this car up much like a Ferrari with quite a bit of toe out. That means it's very, very keen to turn in. However, it's still a massive car with a great long wheelbase that is quite heavy. So it's very easy to be lulled into thinking that it'll just go around a bend like a Boxster. And the simple fact is, it won't. So do be careful, because once this car starts getting out of shape, there's not a lot you're probably going to be able to do to save it. However, on a road like this, which is fast, flowing, doesn't have too many tight sections, this is an absolute joy. I mean, it really is. What a place to be. 
throttle response is great. Brake pedal feel is okay. Never been a, a Maserati strong point. You need to push a little bit further than you think you would. But once you get some resistance out of the pedal, it's actually not that bad. Brakes, incidentally, are another item that are quite expensive to replace if you wear through them, and wear through them you will. If you are considering one of these and you do want a good place to start looking, try Richard Grace. He's not cheap, but I am told with some authority that the cars he sells are very, very good. I would say the old Jag XK, well, the new Jag XK that's quite old now, you know the one I mean, 2006 aluminium one. I drove an example of that with the 4.2 in it, not even supercharged. That was a more comfortable car than this. Whereas then, say, the Merc SLK 55 is probably a little bit better in the bends, but a lot less comfortable than this and actually had more intrusive scuttle shake. This I don't think is really any better, any more rigid, but you don't seem to care as much in here. Seats in here also, again, like my car, not quite as supportive as you'd really hope that they would be. However, this car, as long as you see it more as a luxury vehicle rather than a performance one, I think does a, a pretty admirable job. can stomach the sometimes crippling fuel consumption, the fact that it will cost you quite a bit to run and it's not exactly a bargain to buy, the Grand Cabrio does offer quite a bit. There is however one real deal breaking issue for me with this car, that's the boot. You pretty much don't get one, the roof appears to have taken up all of it and there doesn't seem to be a way to get some space back when the roof is up either. That's a problem. That's a big problem. You get behind the wheel of this and you instantly think, I want to take this down to the south of France. But you're going to have to post your luggage because honestly, you're only going to fit a postcard in the back. It's absolutely ridiculous. Given the sheer scale of this car, I don't think I've ever seen anything with as poor a car to boot ratio before. I, I knew it wasn't going to be huge because it's not even that big in the Coach Porte, but this is a bit of a bad joke. So, buy wisely, befriend a local specialist and your shell station, and you can probably enjoy quite a few happy miles behind the wheel of a Maserati Gran Cabrio. I think it's a wonderful place to be. But, tread carefully and understand this is not a perfect car, this is not really a sports car. It is about the only four-seater convertible luxury car that I know for anything approaching sensible money that's still reasonably modern. It's very rare that I drive a car and can honestly say there is nothing out there in the market quite like it. But that's the case with this car. So that's all from me today. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already. A huge thank you to Luke for lending me his car. We'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.